right now. Um, I don't know, Rosa, if this includes you as a speaker, but I'm going to make a, a invitation to everybody. If you are not doing anything that you want to hide behind your name and screen, uh, then let's see your face. I'm sure that the speaker will be happy to see that. Uh, just on the technical, please keep yourselves on mute. Uh, you've probably been through this kind of introduction many, many times before. Please keep yourselves on mute. Uh, comments should come through the chat. Uh, Rosa has said that she's happy to take questions during the presentation, but they should be put in chat and I'll actually find an appropriate time to say, okay, how about taking a couple of questions now and then we'll go on from there. You can expect the program to last uh, up to an hour, a presentation, questions, discussion. Uh, so those are the technicals and it is being recorded. So be sure not to misbehave on screen. <laughs> um, uh, let me uh, begin by saying, first of all, introducing myself. I'm David Kramer. I am the director of the library at the Jewish Theological Seminary, uh, and it has been our privilege for a good number of years now to run a book talk series each year that is devoted to uh, books that we would believe that we believe would be of uh, particular interest to a broad Jewish audience that they have import for one reason or another, and we've had a great variety of works. Uh, and this one I think is actually different than anything we've seen before, but I'll say a word about that in a moment. Uh, you all, when you signed up, saw the announcement for this talk. And I assume that means therefore that you saw the official bio. What I'm gonna do actually is add the unofficial bio, that is to say the bio that I or someone like I can provide uh, that someone who's just reading off of the standard can't exactly uh, do at the same time. Uh, Rose and I are old friends and uh, it really is a pleasure and privilege to be able to have her here in this library program. We went to college together, Brandeis University. Uh, we also both at the time lived in South Florida, or our families were in South Florida. And so during vacations, we made a little bit of mischief together. Uh, <laughs> and I learned at that time that Rosa is one of the most creative, one of the most invigorating, I mean, just wonderful to engage in any and every conversation with. She's always got something super intelligent to add. And uh, in connection, tonight's program, uh, I'll say that there are actually two things that attracted me to her book immediately. Uh, I knew that they needed to be a JTS library book talk. Uh, the first is that um, Dwell Time, uh, a memoir, uh, is told, yeah, nice, um, is told by an author uh, who was born in Cuba as a Cuban Jew and whose family then escaped from Cuba, coming to South Florida and made a home in the United States uh, where you, Rosa, grew up most of your life, but your initial years were spent uh, in Havana. Um, so, you know, one, one piece of our interest is the simple fact that the JTS Library is always interested in offering insight into parts of Jewish experience and history uh, that may be underattended, that we don't focus on enough. And this is a very important chapter in our recent history. So as you write about this, it's and your experience as an immigrant, as a refugee, um, all of that is very, very important for appreciating a very particular Jewish population and its experience. Beyond that, though, and this was equally as attractive to the library, is the fact that Rosa is an art restorer conservator. Um, and this is an absolutely magnificent endeavor, the uh, nuances of which, well, the art restoration, I don't appreciate, or art conservation, I should say. Uh, I don't appreciate in all of its details, but Rosa, as I read your memoir, uh, there was far more that I recognized 
than I would have guessed before undertaking the reading because we at the library, with our vast and wonderful rare collection of Judaica going back many centuries, have a full-time conservator on staff. Um, it is her work that makes it possible for researchers to read rare manuscripts that might be compromised, that makes it possible for us to loan our manuscripts to museums like the Metropolitan Museum of Art. We just loaned to the Uffizi Gallery um, in Italy. Uh, we've got a very extensive loan program and all of that would be impossible without this work that only very specially trained people can do. And you are one of those specially trained people. And the way you bring together uh, the discussion of your personal story with your life's professional commitments uh, is really remarkable. And I think everyone will appreciate what you have to say. I want to add just one more thing. I don't know if I'm putting Rose on the spot here. Um, but one of the greatest weeks of my life um, that I ever spent was with Rosa and a small group of people uh, going to Cuba, where Rosa actually served as our guide. Um, and it could not have been better. So Rosa, I hope that's praising only a, a little bit too much. Uh, and I hope I haven't embarrassed you, but please go right ahead. Thank you, David. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, I'm so happy to be among this group of people. And I'm a fan myself of the JTS library, though I haven't been there in a long time. And it, well, maybe what I'll do is I'll start by reading the opening of the book. How's that? It's a couple of, just a couple of, a page and a half to just set the the tone for what it is. And then That's I can great. That'll it. orient us. Thanks. So the book, as David mentioned, is called Dwell Time, A Memoir of Art, Exile and Repair. And it is structured. Um, it, it takes its inspiration for the structure from Primo Levi's wonderful memoir, The Periodic Table, in which elements are the, um, you know, the, the, each chapter is an element and each chapter is about an element, but about his family. And that's how I wrote this book as well. And I begin the first chapter. Um, the first chapter one is called Marble and it's all about marble. And here's how it begins. In a Jewish orphanage on the edge of old Havana, a little girl drags a soapy rag over a long white marble tabletop there are 20 of these tables, and twice a day, this six-year-old's job is to scrub 10 of them clean of chicken, rice, and black beans, the typical ingredients of a Cuban supper. Pork would never be served here, of course. Neither would beef, because it costs too much. On Friday nights, the orphans might eat soup with matzo balls or long egg noodles slathered with chicken schmaltz. The girl likes both of these foods. But she won't eat kasha varnishkas no matter how hungry she is, how much they spank her or send her to bed hungry. She is maddeningly stubborn. Beatings don't subdue her. Neither does making her scrub the marble tables, the hardest task given to any of the little ones. This girl became my mother. She was born on September 8, 1932, a national holiday in Cuba that celebrates La Virgen de la Caridad del Cobre, the island's patron saint. Most Catholic girls, born, oops, sorry, excuse me. Most Catholic girls born on this day are named some version of Caridad, charity in Spanish. They are typically dressed in yellow baby clothes, the color linked to Ochun, the powerful Yoruba spirit deity syncretized with La Virgen de la Caridad. My mother's parents, Jewish immigrants, named her Ita in Yiddish and Ilda in Spanish. Three weeks later, her mother died. I was a 10 pound baby, my mother says, blaming herself. She also faults the system that required C-sections be authorized by a priest or a rabbi. By the time the rabbi arrived at the hospital, I had torn my mother up, she says. In Afro-Cuban Yoruba religions, each orisha or spirit deity manifests specific qualities of the supreme being. Ochun controls fresh waters, rivers, divinity, and fertility and love. The men and women born under her guardianship are gregarious and seductive, the life of the party, but cross them and watch out. This river Orisha is vain, spiteful, and quick to anger. 
I don't forgive and I don't forget, my mother has said for as long as I can remember. Throughout my life, I have received this warning. So that's the opening of the book. And it sets up the parable, if you will, of my mother's upbringing in this um, troubled situation as an orphan who was not quite an orphan. Her father was alive, but she, he couldn't take care of her. So she was passed around between relatives and had a lot of abandonment issues at a very early age, which made her sort of fierce, belligerent and angry. And when she married my father, who whose family comes from a different part of the Eastern European Jewish migration to Cuba and has experienced Cuba in quite a different way. My, they were a stable family. They had, they had money and they were middle class. And when she married into that family, she finally felt a modicum of safety in her life. But when the Cuban revolution happened and my family left, the renewed poverty that they experienced in Miami really kind of set my mother off the edge, if you will. She was very volatile while I was growing up. And this book is really a, a way of kind of finding a repair between her and me, even though we've always gotten along. I mean, I've always come to Miami. I didn't abandon my family. I moved away eventually and lived in the Northeast and then in Los Angeles working as an art conservator. I never abandoned my family, but I always lived far away from them, recognizing that it was too difficult to live near them. But um, this book, which was written right after my father died in, uh, my father died in 2019 and I began this work in 2020, was in a way a, a, a metaphor for using repair to repair this family story. So that's where it originates. Um, I mean, I can read some more now if you want, or I can take some questions. How how do you, how would you like us? To well, give, why don't you give uh, folks a sense? I, I mean, I'd love for you to expand upon some of the connections, the, the way you use the work you've done um, as a way into discussing the more personal experiences. Right. Well, you know, the thing is that the work that I do, I I'm a, I went to the Institute of Fine Arts at NYU. I went to Brandeis with David um, and went to the Institute of Fine Arts at NYU afterward and studied art conservation. And I kind of fell into it <clears throat> because I actually, speaking of rare books and manuscripts, what I was really eager to do was study rare books and manuscripts after college. But I fell into this field through a professor at Brandeis, whose wife was quite a famous paper conservator. And she recommend, he recommended me for a fellowship at the Metropolitan Museum, which I did in my junior year of college. And from there, it just kind of followed. And when I went into conservation, when I started the program at NYU, basically paintings was the thing. Everybody wanted to be a paintings conservator. That's the glamorous type of conservation. That's that's the the most uh, revered and what people think is really the best thing. But I was very inexperienced. I didn't have the proper requirements to get into school. And um, I didn't dare play in that arena. So I had two choices. I could be a paper conservator or a sculpture conservator. And I began working on archeological digs in Israel during my early training. And I became an archeological conservator and that's how I started to learn this way of, of taking care of the past. And, you know, one of the, one of the things that to me was very, um, not that, you know, when you write, writing is an act of discovery. So you have an idea of what your book's going to be, but when you write it, it becomes something a little bit different. And in the writing, I found there were a couple of things that I found a renewed reverence for material culture and specifically buildings and archeological sites, because we live in a world today where information is so easily manipulated and where people can um, create stories out of anything and they can craft truths that may not be true, but buildings don't lie, they're there. So for example, I talk a lot in the book about going back to Cuba to restore buildings. 
and finding that um, that that it was remarkable to see so much heritage left in this country because for example the cuban government the current communist cuban government likes to say that there is no middle class in cuba but that that cannot be true because there are hundreds and hundreds of apartment buildings in havana um similarly and i i feel like i'm talking to an audience where i can say this the current dialogue that sort of questions whether um the Jewish people have any truthful claim to the land of Israel, the 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 evidence is there. You know, the material culture is thousands of years old and it's there and it's layered and it exists. And you can say what you want, but that heritage it tells a different story. And that's why to me, the material culture is so important to preserve because it retains the story. Okay. So you've gone back. You've gone back to your ancient Jewish self. You've gone back to your uh -huh. Cuban self. Um, let's start with the ancient Jewish self, what you just said. Can you describe something that you were involved in working on and what you learned, how you responded, how others learned from it? Well, you know, one of my very, my very earliest project uh, when I was in grad school, I was supposed to go on a fabulous dig in Turkey after my first year of grad school, but they pulled their funding. And that was in the 19, the early 1980s, late 70s, early 80s, when you could not excavate in many countries and be Jewish. So you were, lim you were limited to Greece, to Italy, to Greece, and to uh, Israel, of course, and one or two other places, Cyprus, um, I, a Turkey, you could work in Turkey, but you couldn't work in many other places. And so um, when my dig in Turkey fell through, I decided to go to Israel and start working there and working. And I worked at a site called Tel Michal in Herzliya that was completely uninteresting. The finds there were nothing of any of any interest. They were it was a poor it was a poor coastal settlement. But I learned there so much about materials because there were certain things that were so fundamental about treatment that, you know, for example, if you've ever been on an archaeological site, people find tons, hundreds and thousands of pieces of pottery. And the archaeologists learn a lot of information from that pottery. And as the restorers of the pottery, basically you're looking for connections between things that look identical. So you learn to take nothing for granted when you're looking at something. And that becomes a sort of metaphor for how you deal with individuals and your own skills. So you're faced with a tray of damaged things or a table full of damaged things. And the smallest connection is a, is a victory. So you basically learn on the one hand to really cherish every small victory as something that is important. And similarly, not to take anything for granted because sometimes things that look like they go together don't. And, you know, part of what I tell in this story, I tell the story of my family and I tell the story of my fractured family and learning to understand who they were and why they became the way they were, but also to understand myself and my relationships to my partners, my, my first marriage that ended in divorce, and looking inside, using these principles of repair, like in conservation, we we have a lot of um, uh, philosophies that we 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 work with. For example, that you everything that you do needs to be able to be undone in the future by someone else. The idea that our mark on culture cannot be permanent; it can only be temporary. Somebody else has to be able to reverse it or reimagine it in the future because we're only limited by what we know. And similarly, you know, it is. But 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 what the but the what the field of materials conservation is fundamentally and above everything, it's the art of understanding damage. Because if I'm going to repair, you know, if this if this, if this were a ceramic and it cracks and falls off a table, it's it's different if it breaks from falling off a table than if it breaks because it was buried for a hundred years. So the nature of damage 
is the guide to how you need to repair things. And so when I understood that concept that conservation is yes, good hand skills and science and understanding the history, but it's also the, the ability to be, to have compassion, if you will, for how damage happens. From there, you it doesn't take a lot to translate that into relationships with people. And where I took it was with to my own family. First. Um, I mean, some of your chapters are organized around exactly what you just described, focusing on particular materials. Um, right. Is there a, a section that your mind goes to where you use a material in order to shed light on relationship, on repair, and so forth that you could share with us? Sure. Um, I I yeah. I don't know if I can find it to read it, but for example, in a, I talk about concrete. I talk about reinforced concrete in one of these sections um, because uh, let's see, um, reinforced concrete. Let me just see if I can find it. If I can't, don't worry. Um, <laughs> uh, the thing about, re okay, so reinforced concrete, which is a material that a lot of our world is made out of reinforced concrete. I'll, you know, you look at, I write, look out your window, most of what you're going to see is made out of concrete. And concrete is a material that is, of course, pr present in the ancient world. But what we know of as reinforced concrete, what makes the ability to big build big buildings and highways and bridges, is a product of the late 19th century. And it came to the United States right around the turn of the 20th century. And it came to Cuba at the exact same time because Cuba and the United States had the same technologies. And one thing about reinforced concrete is it depends on the material, the cement and the iron rebar. And those two things when put together create this extremely strong matrix that allows for these giant buildings. However, it's extremely fragile as well because when it starts to crack if you don't attend to those fissures early enough you start to get corrosion of the interior steel which is a self-perpetuating process that just gets worse and worse and in the book and the chapter on concrete i liken that to marriage that marriage when the two when the two parties are very strong and connected can be like reinforced concrete this kind of bond that that is bigger than the parts themselves. But if you don't attend to the small fissures, the pieces of damage, then it, 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 they implode. And so I use that also as a metaphor because my father in Cuba wanted very badly to be an architect, mm -hmm. but his father who was this Hungarian immigrant to Cuba and started a business said, architect, what, what are you talking about architect? You're gonna work for me I, in my store because that's what you're gonna do. And my father lamented that for his entire life. That was that was one of the problematic aspects about my family and my parents' marriage is that when they came from Cuba, my father was never really able to be a successful businessman like his father was in Cuba. And so they fell in and out of poverty all the time, my family. They were constantly going bankrupt and losing their, you know, their businesses. So, and, and that was, Part of that story. Um, can you tell us something? I mean, you're referring to the immigration to Cuba. Obviously, you know, though Jews who immigrated from Europe to Cuba expected that that would remain their home, that they would stay there. Um, but yeah. and they formed a very distinct identity and then had to uh, flee. Uh, can you say something about that community? I know there's a small community left. But there's a small community left, but the majority of it, you know, it was very much like Eastern Europeans who came to New York, the idea that they would have to go somewhere else, you know, they got a lot and a lot of the Jews that got to Cuba, got there as a stopping point and then left for New York, because or the United States because when the boats set America during those years of the very strict immigration laws in the 20s, they could drop you off in Havana or Buenos Aires or Caracas or any number of places. And Cuba was great because A, it was really close to the US. And second, because Cuba and the United States in the 20s and 30s, like were one country. Cuba was almost like a, a 51st or whatever. We didn't have 50 states then, but one of the states. So you were guaranteed to get into the country. So all the Eastern Europeans immediately applied for visas and then 
they waited because it took six months. But in the six months that it took, my fa- my two grandfathers thought like, this is great. Why do we need to go to another country? Why do we need yet another country to learn yet another language when we're finally starting to understand Spanish? So they stayed and they never in a million years expected that they would have to leave. And Cuba being a Catholic country was always a different animal than many other Catholic Latin American countries because historically Cuba was the mercantile center of the Spanish presence in the Western hemisphere. So the church was never extremely powerful there. The church didn't have a lot of power. So that kind of virulent anti-Semitism that you might find in big Catholic countries just didn't exist in Cuba. It was, you know, it was like light, but the Jews had every kind of uh, uh, synagogues, kosher butchers, uh, mikvahs, whatever you needed for a Jewish community. They had, they had schools. Well, the orphanage that my mother grew up in was a Jewish orphanage um, that was part of a network of, of Jewish homes around Latin America and I think in Europe as well. And they were happy there and they had no concept that they would have to leave. Now, they didn't have to leave. It wasn't like um, fleeing the Nazis. They were not being persecuted to be killed. This was not, this was a different thing. It's just that because the Soviet Union was anti-Semitic and so directly so, and people had seen what Stalin had done to the Jews, the very idea that this was Cuba's new direction no one was going to wait around to find out about it. Certainly the Jewish community wasn't going to wait around. And so they left. And that had that. So one of the things I talk about, the reason I call it art exile and repair is because the double, the double exile is the key to it that they were only in, you know, when I thought about it one day, because I don't think of myself as from Los Angeles at all, but I have lived in Los Angeles longer not longer. I've lived in Los Angeles as long as my entire family lived in Cuba. From the mm-hmm. time my, my grandfathers arrived in 1925, and by 1961, we were gone. That's, what is that, like 36 years or something like that, right? And I've lived in LA since 1988. It's about the same amount of time. Not, you know, almost the same amount of time. But I don't think of myself as Angelino. I think of myself as a Cuban Jew. So it it's about the imprint of that of a place on on a family. Mm-hmm. I, w- I want to ask you to expand on this. I, 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 I you use the term double exile, um, yeah. which is very interesting because scholars who have worked on the Sephardic experience, on the expulsion of Jews from Iberia, from um Spain and Portugal to other parts of Europe, um have I mean, this is not brand new, but I think there's a special attention to it in recent years, to the degree to which this was a double exile, right? They experienced themselves as being of the Jewish exiles that go back many centuries, but also as exiles from Spain. And both of those identities were powerful, and both of those geographical locations, both the promised land and in its way, right, the second promised land for Jews, at least during certain centuries, both of them were geographical orientations, right? We were kicked out of not our home long ago, but our homes. So it sounds to me like you're saying something very similar. Can can you expand on what that means to you? Yeah, yeah. Um, And it's interesting you mentioned the Sephardic experience because my good friend Ruth Behar, who is a uh, uh, she's an anthropologist and a novelist, has a book coming out next year. It's written for middle grades. It's like for kids. But um, it's a book that follows uh, generations of of this Sephardic girl. You know, like it's the same girl that keeps appearing and they're expelled from Spain and then they go to Turkey and then they leave Turkey and go to Cuba. Um, and then they leave. So there, that is even a bigger situation. But in the case of my family, um, you know, they were clearly 
my 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 father's uh, father was from Transylvania, so it's Hungarian speaking Romania. My mother's father was from Bessarabia, which is also Romania, but the other side, Eastern Romania, and they were both um, very different in their character. And they were immigrants to Cuba. They were in their teens, their late teens when they went to Cuba. And my parents experienced themselves as, well, they were born in Cuba. They were Cubans, but they're Cubans the way we're Americans. You know what I mean? With this with this little bit of, uh, of a flavor of something else that isn't quite the same as the general population where, you know, my mother, my mother uh, remembers when the St. Louis, the ship came to Havana and was turned away. She was a very little girl, but that the entire Jewish community came out to the presidential palace to ask the president to allow the ship to remain. And she remembers as a little girl from the orphanage marching on the, on the presidential palace. So the notion of double exile is really like, it's a kind of uncertainty, you know? It's a kind of uncertainty about whether you belong anywhere. And certainly I can tell you that in the last weeks, in the last few weeks, um, the art world where I work has been very, very uh, hot, if, for lack of a better word. And many of us have just felt, wow, you know, this is, this is so shocking. Um, we, we'd never experienced anything like that. And where my mind went directly was like, oh my God, if we have to leave this country, where are we going to go? And my husband, Todd, whom, you know, said, what do you mean if we have to leave this country? Are you insane? Because he has not that, he doesn't have that experience. His, his great grandparents came to this country. So They've been here for generations, but I have literally, I'm, I'm two generations. I mean, no, I'm two generations away from Eastern Europe and then Cuba. So it's like every generation has, has migrated. I, I don't know if I answered your question. No, you, you did. I think very much, just to make it clear, I think everybody uh, caught what you were suggesting, but um, do, do you want to clarify with a little bit of specificity what you've experienced in the art world? Yes, I will be glad to. And I'm happy to be able to talk to a friendly audience because it's been very trying. So a letter was, do you know about the letter? The, the but People may not, so just describe it. Okay, so there was a letter published that was put forth by a group of artists um, uh, a few uh, you know, about a week ago. Uh, it was signed by like 3,000 artists, including you know, people you like, uh, Nan Golden, Barbara Kruger, the novelist Rachel Kushner, the um, the actress uh, Tilda Swinton, but it's 3,000 people, lots of people, essentially uh, condemning the bombing of Gaza, condemning the bombings, the war, calling for a ceasefire, imploring the president not to fund war, not a word about the massacre. Not a, and they didn't go as far as the Harvard students who actually blamed um, Israel for what befell those communities, but it was close enough, like in the mm -hmm. sense that, that there was no mention that there was any, you know, and, and you know, they use the words, of, you know, they use those words, the buzzwords, genocide, apartheid, racism, you know, and it was published in Art Forum online, and it was published in a in a website called Hyperallergic Online. Um, and I have a I have a particular good relationship with Hyperallergic. The the editor in chief blurbed my book, gave me a beautiful blurb, and they ran an excerpt. And all of a sudden it's like this is my community and my commute and how could my community say this? So I didn't really know what to do. I was just like in shock at home. But then I started getting emails from Jewish friends. And from curators in Israel saying we're sending a, a response letter, and the response letter was extremely measured, but but it, at that moment there's there's been a lot of trauma in the art world, because you know, and and this isn't even to talk about other curators and collectors to whom for whom I you know that I have no access to this. And is you just you you awesome. mentioned this is in the in our discussion of double exile, so you're suggesting that this is experienced as a kind of exile from this community. 
It is, but it also triggered in me the idea that, oh my God, we're not safe, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. The other the other day, this thing came out. It turned out to be a, a a fake thing. It turned out to be fake. Thank goodness. But someone sent me a post on Instagram by the artist Ai Weiwei, where basically uh, it was it was virulently anti Jewish mm. uh, about how the Jews own the media and and everything in the United States, and they're creating this narrative against the Palestinians and. Um, and we're basically, it turned out to be fake, thank mm. goodness. But, but those of us who got it believed it in that moment, and the, and the specter of leaving suddenly became real because that for for me because it lives right below the surface for me. Whereas my husband thought I was losing my mind. The idea that we would leave, like yeah. why we have to leave? Because that kind of notion of having to get up and go. Um, you know, like for <laughs> this is gonna sound crazy, but so for example, in terms I do this in terms of like earthquakes or whatever, but also there's a little part of me, like I like I like to make sure that there is like enough cash in the house to get get the hell out of touch. <laughs> like I think, well, if and I say if there's an earthquake, we won't be able to get into the cash machines, but it's also this idea that within a short period, you'd have to leave. And I believe that is a, entirely a product of this rapid migration within- You, you such can't leave the anxiety behind. And it's an intergenerational anxiety. I don't. I. I don't want to um, end before we invite questions with this part of the discussion. So I want to come back to um, another part of your discussion in the book, just for a few minutes. Um, you've been drawn to Cuba. You've gone back many times. Have you counted it? How many times have you been back? I've count. I've must oh, almost counted it. You know, I'm yes, not. And I, I think I've been back to Cuba about like fifty-two times since nineteen ninety-two. About fifty-two. <laughs> okay. About. about. Um, Let take. You know. So so I mean clearly this is you know a calling in multiple senses of the word. I mean something is calling you there. Um, and your calling has led to relationships. Um, it has allowed you to help to rebuild, right? To be involved in preservation, restoration. Um, what's yes, the and meaning of well, that to you? What, what, how, how do you see that as living out your deep self? Yes, well, okay, a couple of things. One is that when I was a young girl, I could not wait to get out of Miami because that narrative that, that that oh poor us exile narrative of like oh we lost our country we lost our country what i was thinking as a young child is what are you talking about we lost our country we're here this is where everybody wants to be we're privileged we're the privileged immigrants who got to come in here what's the deal so i was ready to get out of miami and as you know when you knew me growing up at brandeis i was very un-cuban i didn't care at all about cuba because i wasn't part of my story um, at that moment. So, but what happened was through a series of different traumatic experiences that I had one day, I happened to chance upon a, 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 an announcement for a preservation conference in Cuba. And I applied and I went, and when I went, the first thing that struck me and it struck me like literally like being hit in the head was that this place that I felt had nothing to do with me because it was my parents' home, my parents' path, not mine, had everything to do with me because it is a country where 100% of the buildings are historic and they all needed work. So mm. it was the, the question was, how was it possible that I found that no one had told me about this? And how was it possible that I found this place at a very moment when I had all the tools that it took to help preserve those buildings. And ever since then, I've gone back because it's just the most remarkable place. As you know, you've been there. It has, because, because it's never had developers tear down its historic fabric, it's all there. And so you can read the entire history of the Western hemisphere. The, the buildings tell the story. They tell the story of, of Spanish conquistadores, of Jews coming in, of French artisans and and Catalonian um, 
sh uh, sugar caramelizers. It, it's just this gorgeous tale that is there for the reading. And so when I went back for the first time was when the Soviet Union had just collapsed. And I thought, great, any day now I'm going to be able to work here. And part of the narrative in this book has been how many times I thought, it's going to open up, it's going to open up, I'm going to be able to establish a private practice in Havana. And, and then something happens to thwart it. So I've never been able to work in Cuba. I've never actually solved a single conservation problem for a building. However, I have given a lot of advice to people and have brought materials down. But but my hands on a major project never have, and it never will because now I'm, I just don't have the energy to, you know, <laughs> to put together a giant team and all that. Okay. And it's been complicated. I mean, advances in relations and back when we went to Cuba with you, it was easy to get to Cuba. Uh, it was during the Obama years, actually, when there was some loosening of that. But uh, Mark wants to know, it's a very basic question. How do you travel to Cuba from the U.S.? Um, As if you are not a Cuban, if you're just a regular old U.S. citizen, you buy a plane ticket and you go. You go from Miami and you go. Now, um, I have to check what the current U.S. law is, but as far as the Cubans are concerned, they want you. They need the money. You can uh, you can stay in a government hotel. You can stay in a boutique hotel. You can stay in an Airbnb. There's all kinds of ways to go to Cuba. And American Airlines flies like five flights a day from Miami. They're about to expand back to the United to New York flights as well, and L.A. Um, so yeah, it's not hard at all. I'm happy to answer a question about it. Um, you can. It's nice to go on a tour group you know, to put a little group together because then somebody is like solving certain problems for you, like the transportation or if that restaurant's closed, you know, because it was a little bit of a nutty place. It's not an unsafe place. It's not nutty, like, and it's not a kind of place where, you know, the language is so foreign that you're not going to understand it. You'll understand it. If you speak Spanish, you can, or whatever. If you live in New York, you'll understand it. But, um, <laughs> um, but you can go. Okay. Uh, I, I don't know if you've got the comments in front of you. Uh, Nina yes, asked, yes. yeah, what were some of the difficulties and revelations you found with writing about your Jewish Cuban identity? And how does this speak to how Jewish identity is appearing within the Jewish literary canon today? Where do you see it going? Complicated question. Complicated. I'll, okay. The difficulties and revelations I found with writing about my Jewish Cuban identity that is a great question because my Cuban Jewish identity has been like a continuum, I, like a ping pong table where it ping pongs from one end to the other. Sometimes I feel very Jewish. Sometimes I feel very Cuban. And then sometimes I feel very Cuban Jewish, but it's mainly gone back and forth. And, and, and putting it together is part of the, of the thing itself, you know, um, uh, because a lot of the Cuban Jews that I know in, you know, obviously no 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 uh, community is a monolith but my experience of being cuban jewish has a lot to do with my family so having having it to do with my family means that it's 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 fraught with certain emotional complexities so it, it is it's complicated but you know in those complicated places where things are difficult that's where that's where writing is 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 juicy you know, because you mine those tough places, that's where the writing is juicy. But in terms of um, Jewish identity appearing with, within the Jewish literary canon today, I'm not really well versed in that. And remember, I'm also not a novelist. Um, and I think novelists have a better angle on that than I do. Um, I'm going to write a novel next. I've, I've decided <laughs> that, no, because, you know, I was writing a novel when, when this, when this a opportunity to write this memoir appeared and I have about 150 pages and actually what happened the reason this book happened is because I was writing a, a book about Cuba in the 1950s based in in it that took place in a nightclub it was a kind of a fictionalized version of my Tropicana book and in comes a character who is a Romanian art restorer and just starts to take over the narrative because fiction will do that, like characters appear and they just make their presence known. And so I hired a book coach to help me with it. And it was through conversations with the book coach 
but this other book happened. Became clear that it was personal. Um, right. Here's a very um, basic question, very important. How vibrant is the Cuban Jewish community today and are they able to practice religion and culture freely? It, I assume that you're speaking of the Cuban Jewish community in Cuba rather than the one right. in Miami, which right. is in fact the bigger one. But the one in Cuba, yes, they're, they're weirdly growing because there's a there are, there are a lot of converts to Judaism in Q, in Cuba, and because the Jewish community of the United States takes care of Jews everywhere, the Jewish community is actually doing okay compared to other communities. They have, like, say, medicines that other communities don't have because you know, like, the Federation of Atlanta will take a trip to Cuba. And then they'll bring tons of supplies and materials. I mean, nobody in Cuba is doing that well right now. It's a tough moment in the country. The double whammy of Trump and the pandemic really, really hurt their their tourist economy. But in, um, I forget what year it was. It was like 1996, maybe, that Castro, it wasn't like it was, religion was never criminalized under Castro, but you couldn't be, like an open practicer of Catholic of Catholicism or Santeria and be, uh, you know, a, like have good jobs or anything like that. So they kind of de decriminalized, for lack of a better word, that at a certain point and the community, the Jewish community um, benefited from that as well. However, I will tell you one thing, Castro never had it out for the Jews. And this was so interesting because Unlike other uh, countries in the Soviet bloc, um, yeah, they were aligned with, you know, the Soviet Union and those nations. So there was always a lot of um, vitriol about Israel. But for example, up until the special period where the Soviet Union collapsed and Cuba had no money at all, Castro was allowing kosher food to be imported, kosher meat, matzahs for Passover. Um, and that never ended actually. Except even in the except in the moments when there were other extenuating circumstances, and that and a friend of my father's, who was one of these people that was creating a detente with Cuba in the early days in the seventies, told me that 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 Castro was obsessed with Israel as a country, even though he uh, had to speak ill of it, it, you know, with his political cohort. But he was obsessed with Israel as a country, and in particular with Golda Meir, hmm. because actually Golda Meir wrote to him to congratulate him for the revolution when he when he marched into Havana. She she wrote him and sent him a congratulatory message, and he was really interested in her and her rise to power. And actually, this guy, this friend of my father's, brought him Golda's autobiography hmm. once. That's beautiful. You know, I, I mean, you only read from the book at the very beginning, and I feel we've been cheated. So do you have another short section that you could read? I, I mean, I just want to say to everybody, the book is so beautifully written um, that, you know, the story is great, but it's also worth reading it for the way it's written. Why, thank you. Thank you. Hold on, I'm going to read you, let's see, a little section. Um, let's see, wait, yes, I do have the, I do have a little section. This is about becoming a conservator. Mm. This is a, uh, actually, this is, a, this takes place when I'm already a conservator and living in Los Angeles. Hold on. But it speaks to the whole concept of the materials rather than Cuba. Mm -hmm. In 1994, I was living in Los Angeles when a 6.7 magnitude earthquake struck the nearby town of Reseda, although the earthquake came to be known as Northridge. I had barely finished cleaning up the broken dishes that fell out of my kitchen cabinets and the ceiling plaster that littered my dining room when the phone started ringing. Before the power was fully back on and people were allowed to leave their houses, I had a week's worth of appointments. A month later, Every table and bit of floor space in my studio was crowded with ceramic vases, terracotta busts, plaster reliefs, and dented bronzes. Though most of the work consisted of straightforward repairs, some projects had complexities that I had not yet figured out. I learned fairly quickly 
The people's aching needs in times of disaster can overpower even your own professional judgment. I found myself frequently saying, sure, this can be repaired. It won't be perfect, but it'll be pretty close. Even when I had no idea how I would approach an object, it was a product of inexperience. I had never faced a disaster of this magnitude, but it was also a yearning to help people deal with the stress that accompanies upheaval. I can't fix the city or your house, but I can put back together the tiny broken vase, not much bigger than the palm of your hand, that had been a birthday that had been a birthday gift from your deceased husband. Several months after the earthquake, a correspondent from ABC News World Tonight came lo called me looking for a story about conservation and cultural property in the aftermath of a disaster. This was going to be a new angle on the topic. A cameraman shot footage of my studio as the reporter asked me questions. He pointed to a broken terracotta portrait bust of a woman. Isn't this impossible to fix, he asked. Not at all, I responded. Come on, really? Yeah, really. Repairs to terracotta and ceramics are pretty straightforward. There aren't many unknowns to this sort of thing. Okay, show me a project you consider daunting, he said. I looked around the room and settled on a large copper sculpture with a pattern of concentric circles and a warm brown patina. The piece had fallen off a pedestal and had a deep dent on one side and a corresponding crack along the other. To make it right, we were gonna to have to heat the metal, possibly use a dent puller, which was going to darken the patina and then require tricky blending. I explained all of that to the reporter and he asked the right question. Why can't you just polish it up and let it darken again? Conservators try to make as few changes to a work as possible, I explained. Our goal is always to retain original patinas where we can. The cameraman circled us, his, len his lens trained on my face as I spoke. The reporter nodded knowingly, appearing to understand. Months later, however, when the segment aired, our conversation was replaced by his voiceover. You could see me talking, but all you heard was the reporter saying, she isn't daunted by broken ceramics, but she hates metals. Hates metals. Not only had he misrepresented what I said, he'd missed the entire point of conservation. Conservators don't hate what's daunting. We live to problem solve. We unpack the structure of the physical world, untangling the, untangling the nature of deterioration and repair one step at a time. Beautiful. You know, I, I just I just realized as I'm listening to you, um, you're a Kabbalist. I'm not sure you know this, right? But you're a Kabbalist. The two themes that have run through this are exile and repair. And when the Sephardi exiles were exiled from Spain, um, that was the beginning of the kind of Kabbalah that focused on tikkun olam, on repair. And it was very precise. It wasn't repairing the whole world at once because that couldn't be done, right? The world was too, the, the brokenness originated, according to Luriana Kabbalah, with the breaking of vessels, with the breaking of vases, right? Which held the divine sparks. And those shards were scattered. There was an earthquake, the exile, right? The earthquake was the exile. Those shards were scattered. And in order to restore the world in order to repair the world, right? Jews needed to commit themselves to working on one vessel at a time, to put it together using mitzvot, right? Which is the way Kabbalah did it. But what you've just re read um, is precisely the same process. Um, there's oh an earthquake, God. there's an exile, um, and the response is to repair, to repair one vessel at a time. Uh, I don't think I'm going too far. Oh, I can't wait to talk to you more about this, David. We're <laughs> definitely going to have this conversation. In greater okay, time. great, great. I've so, always been um, yeah, by please. Kabbalah, but I've never delved into it in any way, you know? Oh, it's just so perfect. And and when I heard, you know, the way the theme of exile now gets, you know, through, I mean, earthquake, perfect. I, I remember that earthquake, my family being in LA, and the repair of the vessels. Uh, you can't repair the world without repairing the vessels. And, you know, I wanted to say one more thing since we're on this topic. Yes. One of the things I write about in this book is that when you 
face a project that is problematic. And a lot of projects are straightforward, but some are very complex. The only way you're going to be able to do it is if you can somehow conceptualize the possibility of it. So if you walk in and you see, someone says to you, as they've said to me, can you move this gigantic hundred foot mosaic from outdoors to indoors? And I go, oh no, that's impossible. Yeah, then it's impossible. But all repair begins with the idea that it's possible. Mm -hmm. And I think about this a lot these days because of the, the brokenness of so many things, you know? And um, yeah, I didn't well, realize that about Tikkun Olam. And yeah, like, yeah that that's, was... that's where the notion as we know it begins. Um, thank you everybody for um, joining for us. Uh, thank you, Rosa, for really superb uh, presentation. A quick uh, question. I, I am to... sorry. Can I just a quick question? Sure, I missed, I, I missed the talk because of some medical stuff I needed to take care. Is there any kind of recording that I can listen yes, to? Yes, this now? has all been recorded, Helen. And I will um, be sure uh, to send you the link as soon as this is available. Okay. Do you know my my email? Um, I can see your name on the screen. And I've you, you since you're here, that means you registered for the talk. So I've got your email on the registration. Yeah. Yes. I so, don't have to repeat it now, right? You do not need to repeat it. I will send it to you. So I'll Thank do you it under for... your name or under JTS? What will I be You can email for? me too at JTS if you like. D-A Kramer, D-A-K-R-A-E-M-E-R -E -E at JTS. A dot edu. Um, thank you all for coming. I thank invite you. you back to other library book talks and programs. Um, I just want to let you know that on Thursday we've got an opening of our next exhibit. Um, not uh, not unconnected to what we've been discussing. Um, it is a, an exhibit devoted to the history of the architecture and ornament of great modern synagogues, where modernity means beginning in the 18th century um, and beyond. And we've got wonderful historical images um, of some of the greatest synagogues in Europe and then here in New York early on in the Jewish history here. It's gonna be a wonderful exhibit and it will open on Thursday and come up to JTS at any time. We will make announcements for guided tours um, but you're welcome to drop by whenever the library is open. I wish you all well, um, and I share my prayer for peace uh, with all of yeah. you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. David, closed I'm on Friday, you. right? What's that? We're closing. Yes, the library is closed on Friday. But if you want to put together a group um, of you know friends, five or more, we're happy to even open on you know at times we're regularly closed. Uh, in order to offer tours. So just get in touch with me. I'll take you up on that. Okay, great, Rosa. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Bye, you guys. I'll see you soon. Mm -hmm. Bye. Thanks, Bye -bye. Steve.